Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today I have an awesome interview with Coach Theo. Theo is based out of the UK. He has an after school program that he grew from zero to over 250 students. Watch this interview, implement a lot of the stuff that he talks about. And I know if you're interested in starting an after school program, or if you're just looking to grow and scale your current business, this interview is really going to help you out. See you soon. What I want to do at the beginning here is kind of just give everyone like a one minute background on who you are and, and what you do. So my name is Theo and I was a fencer in the Great British team uh, for about three or four years. And before that, I was training for about seven years. So in total, I was about 11 years as a fencer. Um, and I, I took my experience coaching fencing and um, training younger fences and of course like doing a lot of sport and transferred that to teaching children initially locally and now in schools across London and Surrey and for those who don't know Surrey is like a surrounding county gotcha very cool and I remember the first time we talked you're the first person I've talked to that's in fencing um, that's ever yeah. kind of reached out and uh I think the big reason why I wanted to bring you on the, on today's show is so you can kind of go into depth on the after school programs that you've started and like how you got connected with the schools. Um, so mm -hmm. I kind of want to start there. So when you got started with the business, I know you mentioned to me in the past, like you would kind of call schools and try to get your program in front of them. Um, walk me through the process, like the first school that you got to work with like how how was all of that set up so it's uh when you're dealing with schools it's very much a numbers game so it's not a particularly glamorous process mm -hmm. it's about calling as many schools as possible um sticking to a script that you know is successful and isn't too intrusive isn't too pitchy and trying to get your offer out there as much as possible so the first school was a school called riverhouse school in um in Greenwich in southeast London. Um, it's essentially calling them up, pitching your idea, keeping it as short and sweet as possible, sending a follow-up email or two, and um and then getting your your, your provision from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I wanted to bring this up because a lot of the coaches that I've spoken to over the last seven years now. They will tell me, and this is, I would say more of these coaches that I've spoken to are in the U S when I, when I'm saying this, mm -hmm. but, um, a lot of these guys will be like, yeah, you know, I, I try sending an email out to the schools and they, they just don't get back to me. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm curious, why did you, wait, why did you start to call first instead of just email? Schools receive, I, I don't, I don't want to guess, but maybe thousands of emails a week. Right. Um, and it's so easy to get lost in that inbox. Mm -hmm. um, if you come across as friendly, yet you come across knowing what you're talking about, they will remember you much more easily. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to put a face, or, or at least not face, a voice to the, to the email, mm -hmm. and they'll be much, much more inclined to reply to you. Mm -hmm. um, if you. I've done this before as well unsuccessfully sending out a ton a blanket of um just cold emails mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and their their success rate is so low so it's an uncomfortable process really picking up call, picking up the phone and calling a complete mm -hmm. stranger trying to sell mm -hmm. them something but it's 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 one which is it's it's much more effective than just just hiding behind an email right. and it's 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 much more um effective if you're personalizing your email as well mm -hmm. so it's even something as simple as hey x like putting the name in and putting the name of the school in as well it's 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 much more effective than mm -hmm. just a blanket hi comma right your school it, it it's it, it people can tell when you're sending them a cold email and when it's at least right. personalized. yeah yeah i personally like calling too so much better because i can get results faster like mm -hmm. if i talk to the person and they say no 
great, I can move on and I don't have to worry or think, oh, when are they going to send me an email back? Because uh, that's that's a waiting game. And um, I like things to be done quickly so I have feedback faster. So I really like how, how you explain that. So you got your first school and once, once you got in there, like how many, how many kids were part of that initial program? So, um, a couple of times, that was about a couple of times ago, I had two schools, um, in first one had 11 and in another school I had, uh, about 18 students. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, well, from there, from from this time, so September uh, from uh, April to July, it's 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 been much bigger. It's been seventeen schools. So wow. I've, I've really tried to take what was successful from the first time and ramp it up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, using the same process that I used that was successful and cutting out ones that weren't, and mm -hmm. trying to ramp it up to 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 achieve some sort of scale. Right. And how much easier is it now for you to pick up the phone and call someone versus when it was like your first call? <laughs> so much easier. So right. much easier. It's um, it's a complete difference. Like for my first call, even though I had nothing to lose, I was nervous. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's like stammering over my words. <laughs> um, and just, I was, I was unconfident, but once you get practice, it, it becomes a lot easier. Right. Awesome. And how many total students are you serving like up to this date now? So for um, the time just gone by, we did 285 students. Amazing. Uh, and actually that we did a couple of extra days towards the end. So that number is probably a bit north of, of 300. Um, yeah, working in 17 schools. And we also did four or five um, one-off days with, with schools as well. Mm -hmm. So um over 300 amazing awesome and i know when we talked last time you kind of broke down how you have people obviously that are going in to run the sessions for you you're not like going to 17 different schools yourself right so you have a team yeah. um mm -hmm. how many people are part of your team now so at the moment we've got 11 coaches um, gotcha. so they're all part-time workers right because our programs take place after school. Mm -hmm. So um, extracurricular after school programs is where um, all, of our, all of our school classes are at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I have um, 11 different coaches running 17 classes. The, the most classes that one coach was doing was four. And um, we've got a few coaches that are just doing one class. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And as far as like the logistics, do you have everything set up to where are they bringing the equipment to the schools or is it already there? Like how, how do you guys handle all of that? So it's a bit of a mixture. Um, for the majority of schools, the vast majority, we have a kit assigned to each school. So gotcha. um, that took a, a decent amount of upfront investment, mm -hmm. but he, the thing with fencing is there's a lot of equipment. So it's uh, very challenging to find a coach who's willing to, uh, take kit and constantly ship it across London. So mm -hmm. most schools have their own equipment assigned to them. Um, and then for a couple of coaches who have got bigger cars, they, they drive to the session and drop the mm -hmm. kit from for, for each of their sessions. Right. Okay, great. And how, how long have you been doing this business? Like when did you start? So I started actually on a really, really small scale, um, just over two years ago. So gotcha. the the way I actually started was just as a part-time thing while I was I was had a had a job for a bit and I was working on other projects. I was doing this um like straight after lockdown. I was doing outdoor sessions in my neighbor's garden. So my my company is called Fence Club 43. And the reason for that is because sessions started at number 43. Gotcha. So um, next door neighbors. And um it was literally just me, um, my neighbor, my other neighbor, where we were running the one in the classes, their two kids and three other kids from their from the neighborhood, just their mates, um, just running the sessions in a back garden. Um, so that started two years ago. 
Um, and then obviously we, we, we're running those classes in a hall now. But mm -hmm. um, and I, I was doing that. And then uh, the time before I got a couple of schools and then now I'm doing it properly for the last for the last three or four months or so um, in, in 17 schools. So, yeah, it's, wow. it's been it's been it's been it was a steady progression. And then I right. saw that it was continually successful. It was, it was consistently successful. So I thought this can be achieved. At, this can be done at scale. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So let's say you sign up a new school tomorrow. Is it? Mm -hmm the school's responsibility to promote it for you once you're in there? Like how, how is that set up? So again, this, this is, there's an, that every school does it differently. So um, for some schools, it's my job to go in, run an assembly um, or run a taster session or create a video or write a blog or uh, do a poster. Mm -hmm. Other schools, they just completely handle everything. So gotcha. it, 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 it's really um anything from a, a big introduction to just letting the schools do it gotcha so that varies from school to school um mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. okay great and this is a question i thought of before we got on this call but obviously you're your the way you're scaling right now is you're you're calling schools you're just getting into more and more schools um that's all free, right? Like you're, you're not like having to pay for advertising with this business. It's, it's more of just like you're calling the schools to get in. Correct. Correct. I don't, I haven't paid for any advertising with uh, school classes at all. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. All the posters have been done by me, assemblies, everything, um, taster sessions done by me. Calling is, mm -hmm. is nothing more than, seven pound a month from o2 on your network plan right that's right it. right gotcha yeah, that, yeah that's amazing man um and reason why i asked that is like a lot of coaches that i talk to they might have they might be in a different type of market so they, they might not be doing after school programs at schools but they have like their own training program where kids are, are coming to their sessions and um and a lot of coaches that i talk to they I think they have self-limiting beliefs that they can't train more than like 50 kids or, or they can't bring on an assistant coach because they have just too much control and that they, they don't want to lose control of the business. Um, and so I'm curious with you, how, what was your experience like when you brought on your first trainer that, that was going to kind of come on and, and help run things like with you was that an easy process was it rocky like what what was what was that like for you so the initial process was slightly rocky so when i was getting my first coach involved um it was difficult because i'd never i'd never trained anyone to be mm -hmm. uh, a, a school coach I'd never, um, I'd never really transferred my knowledge, even though I had a ton of knowledge from just years and years of fencing. I'd never really transferred that in a way that was a hundred percent understandable to someone who didn't have as much experience as me. Mm -hmm. So the initial training wasn't as good as it was now. It was a bit makeshift, um, and I had to really go to his sessions a lot to support him. Um, so for the first, maybe his first four sessions, I was mm -hmm. there with him, making sure, okay, is this okay? Do you understand this? And giving him help for his class. Mm -hmm. um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, it was about finding what was successful in that process, repeating that and refining on that. Mm -hmm. um, so now when I train coaches, it's, it's very um, process driven. Right. So it will start with videos that I've made, um, then it'll be an in-person training day with a syllabus, lesson plans. Um, and, you know, e e e that training day will have everything encompassed in it from behavior management to fencing technique mm -hmm. to teaching styles. And then it will be invigilation for one, maybe two sessions mm -hmm. before I know that, okay, you know, that they're, they're good to go. Obviously, that doesn't mean I, I, I don't check that they're still doing well doing uh, mm -hmm. engine the class well but it's 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 a lot more smooth now mm -hmm. 
That's amazing. So you have a system now. So system in place to where when someone mm-hmm. wants to work for you, they have to go through a series of of things to learn exactly what you want them to do. So when they go run the session, you know it's running the same way in one school as it is in another school with different coaches. Um, Absolutely. Okay, cool. So I'm really curious in 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 asking you just kind of shifting gears here, but obviously you probably make a lot of phone calls, right? I mean, I, I would think you probably spend a lot of your time as far as like growing the business, doing that and bringing on other coaches Mm -hmm. that work for you. So how do you, I guess, how do you train yourself mentally when like, let's say you have a a day of calls and everybody says no, like what, what do you do personally? Like what's your routine like to like get over the hump when stuff like that happens? Cause like I have my own routine and I haven't really talked about my own routine on YouTube before, but like, what, what do you do to like stay confident? Yeah. So the thing with, say, when you've got a day of sales, it is, you, you have to go in and you have to be honest, it, cold calling isn't fun. Yeah. It is, in my opinion, very monotonous. Yeah. So yeah. it's about, for me, it's about toughening up inside and just be like, okay, look, mm-hmm. you've got to go through this for the next, few days you just got to do it mm. um, when i feel like oh i'm getting rejection 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 i realize it's a numbers game yeah the, num- the numbers don't lie so if i've got i i believe i targeted around 120 130 schools mm. last time and i got um about 14 13 of them came from um came from just cold calls so about 10 percent. now i know that the, the that's a big enough sample size to know that that there is a market for it yeah so absolutely even if even if um 10 schools say no there's likely going to be one that says yes and even if it's not today right two or three might come tomorrow right so it's just about it's about not taking it too personally as well yeah that's where that that's something i've learned um mm-hmm. like i don't i don't do a lot of cold calling right now um but when i was i would say earlier on in my training business i would always try to get in front of club programs or organizations that didn't know me and i would try to call them and get in touch with them to try to do something for free as a way to get in front of their audience because i knew their audience could potentially be clients of mine um and i remember it's funny at the very beginning I was just too afraid to call. So I would just, I would just email mm-hmm. and nothing yeah. like nothing happened. And, and my cold emails were terrible back then too. Like the whole email was about me. It was nothing about them. Yeah. Uh, and then I realized I was like, man, I just, I, I had to force myself to call people. And I remember how uncomfortable that was at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, but like one of those connections literally like there were, there was one point where like one of those connections was responsible for like 70% of our business year after year. And, yeah. and it was mm-hmm. because like, I just, I literally just picked up the phone and called them. Um, and like, and it's funny because I know a lot of coaches that are in a position to, whether it's a cold call or if you, it's just a normal call, like the people just put it off because it's just so much easier to email or text. And yeah, that's the faster thing to do, but it's not the best thing to do. I think people are often under the illusion that it's quicker yeah. to uh, to email mm-hmm. as opposed to. Now, I think in business, when you think about saving money, uh, think about saving time, you're thinking about saving money. Mm-hmm. But if you're not actually earning the same money, you're not getting the same returns on your on your cold emails as you are with cold calls. It, it, I think it's time to reevaluate. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So what, what are your plans coming up in the future? Like, are you like, where are you looking to take this business? No, that's a good question. That's one I've been thinking about a lot over these last, over the last last week or two or so, um, Mm -hmm. because a lot of classes have been finishing for summer holidays now. Now, one thing I definitely am going to do is I'm going to try and double this, um, for, uh, 
starting from January. So the next sales drive will be over um, September and October. And I'm going to try and double it across London and Surrey. Um, Great. Beyond that, whether it's it's expansion to other parts of England, um, internationally or other sports, I'm still working it out. But mm-hmm. one thing I definitely know I'm going to do in the short term is um, it's expand over London and Surrey. Mm-hmm. And again, just use the same things that I've been doing, which has given me success in the past. Right. That's awesome. Have you tried training anyone yet to do the cold calling or is that all that's just 100 percent you and that, that's going to be coming as well that's right going to be coming. i haven't i haven't started on that yet but that's going to be coming from about september yeah man i think that's going to make a huge difference because you'll be able to double the volume of calls mm-hmm. and that person could end up just doing that every single day like when you when you have to focus on other tasks Mm-hmm. I think that piece is going to be, it's going to make your business scale a lot smoother, I would say, just because you'll have a consistency of calls that you can rely on every single day that that person's doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, very Absolutely. cool. Yeah. Now that I've got a bit of revenue coming in from my classes, I can afford to, to start right. thinking of apples and stuff like that. Administ- other administration as well. That's, right. um, I'm definitely looking to add to the team in, in September. Very cool. So last question I have, um, most of the time when I do interviews, I I try to ask this, uh, when you had your job and you were looking to start your business and I know you kind of started it to where it was like a side thing at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, but what was that feeling like when you just fully committed to your business, when you, when you stopped the last job that you had, what, what was that like for you? Because a lot of people that watch our channel are, um, a lot already have a business, but there's also a lot of people that they want to have their own business, but they have another job and that kind of restricts their time. And and they sometimes don't make the jump into their business. So how, what was that transition like for you? Good question. So the way I transitioned into doing this full time was I, I sort of I transitioned over as I knew that workload was going to rapidly increase. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't leave it um, before I'd made any progress on, on, on this. Mm-hmm. I was cutting down whilst scaling up the, the, the fencing business. So the transition actually felt quite comfortable mm-hmm. um, because I was able to um do it at a mo- at a time when i knew the revenue is going to come the, yeah. the, the money's going to come because i've been doing the cold calls alongside my, right. my job I, I was fortunate enough to be fair to have a, a job where i was able to to work flexibly and mm-hmm. uh, i didn't have to, so i could call schools in the daytime mm-hmm. and so that transition was relatively comfortable but because of the expansion from um from two schools to 16, 17 schools is, you know, it's a very big transition. Right, there was a lot of fear because I, again, I had a lot of new staff coming in. Mm. I had um, a lot of, I had like schools were starting over a, a, a different schedule. So I had schools starting this week, this week, this week, this week, this, and it was like really ongoing, a constant flurry of schools starting. And there was a lot of unknowns as well. I didn't, I wasn't a hundred percent sure on the numbers for a lot of schools because Mm-hmm. they didn't give it to me and there was um there was a, there was a lot of other uncertainties as well mm-hmm. like I had some coaches pulling out last minute and I had to find last minute replacement so it was a bit more key a bit fire of five three right but it was I knew that look if I if if a disaster happens with this school and a disaster happens with that school I've still got plenty of other clients right thankfully no disasters happened everything was right all fires were put out right no I, I like that I think that's really good advice too, is like you didn't just have the idea and quit your job and then try to go figure it out. It's like you were already working on it. Mm -hmm. So the, by by the time you quit your job, it was like you were already ready to like, you were already doing it. Um, I think that's a big problem. A lot of people have is um, they, 
quit what they're doing. They try to go into a thing. It's not really doing anything yet. It's not producing any money. Or there's, there's, there's no signs of it producing any income yet. And then they have way more pressure when they quit because now <laughs> they're trying to learn and figure all the stuff out on the fly when they should be working on that while they're doing their other job and then just transition when they're ready. Exactly. The thing is, it, like obviously, when, when it's a full time job, it, it can be difficult to fit it in around around right. the full time job. Mm -hmm. So I, I was fortunate in my position, but it's still 100 percent possible. There's still mm -hmm. more than enough hours a day to work on your own project. Mm -hmm. Get some traction, get some feedback before committing to it full time. Right. Very cool. Awesome, man. Well, is there anything else that I guess let, let's say there's someone watching and they they want to try to start an after school program in their area, uh, and they're kind of like they want to do it, but they're they're stuck and they they might be overthinking. Like, what what is like the most simple thing you could tell someone to just like go after this thing? Like, what would be like a one good action step? one good action step i think if i had to choose one it would be about making sure from a financial perspective you have enough opportunity in that area um mm -hmm. enough potential to growth and then enough potential for growth and enough um enough potential revenue really to replace what you're doing right. so the way i always look at things is like financially forecasting and, and just making sure that there is enough business in that area mm -hmm. if you can forecast that if you have five schools 10 students in each school each paying 10 pounds and you're going to be happy with that income then the commit to it follow processes and, and be disciplined and organized. Right. Right. So basically you're saying if you have another job, the, uh, the, the new business that you want to do, does it have greater opportunity to make more money than this job here and mm -hmm. dialing in the numbers? Like, well, how many kids do I need paying X amount to make more than what I'm doing over here? Um, yes. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point, man. Cause like, I think a lot of coaches, underestimate what the potential is and it's and i think a lot of people just don't know what's actually possible um, yeah because they either haven't talked to someone who's doing it or they they don't know enough about it um but like i mean this this is kind of how i want to wrap our interview up here but like if you think about where you're at right now mm -hmm. compared to where you can take this in five years from now like yeah. how, how much bigger do you think this opportunity is for you at this point? Like just knowing what you know now compared to what you knew on day one, like where, what, what do you think is possible? Like mm -hmm. for, for what you want to do with this business? I think this, this business has huge uh, scalability. I think mm -hmm. the, I think what I knew before was that, there's a big market for it. I believe there was a big market for it. I had a bit of experience in the industry as well a, a while back. But now that I'm like more yeah. aware of it, I'm aware of um, different regions in the UK, I know, I know there's, a, there's, a, there's a demand. And uh, the scalability really is, is big, especially mm -hmm. given my previous results of going from two to 17 schools and mm -hmm. being such a big growth in, in revenue and profit. Mm -hmm. I see no mitigating factors. I see no reason why that can't be reproduced on a on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Given that, especially especially given that I've only targeted so far less than less than four percent of London, and London right. is a very affluent area. So it's it's I, I see no risks as of yet. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. No oh, man. That that's that's really cool and and at the end of the day, you should be really proud of what you've built so far. Cause it does take, it takes a lot of courage to, to pick up this stupid thing and just, just call like, 
it's people like the average person will not do that and they won't even try it because they know on the other side of that phone call, there's, there's a lot of failure and people are afraid to be rejected. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think you already know that that's just part of the game. And, and the more calls you take, the more successful you're going to be. <laughs> and you have to, you have to get used to, you have to get used right. to those because even for me, I've got 90% no's mm -hmm. and that's out. That's actually really good. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. That's very I mean, if, if you're targeting schools and there's, there's 20 students, what, 15 to 20 students per school and you get nine, uh, nine times out of 10, no, that there's still huge, mm -hmm. uh, casting in there's over 20,000 schools in, in, in London. So it's just, there's, there's, there's no issues with, with a no. Yeah. I've seen. That's amazing. Awesome, man. So this is a non-business question. Um, mm. so how did you, like, I know what fencing is. I, I think most people who watch this know, know what it is. Um, yeah. but how did you go from, cause I guess you were like, com like really, really competitive, like at the yeah. highest level. Right. Um, I was, yeah, I was on the under 20, uh, international team. Right. I mean, that's amazing. So during that time, were you thinking about wanting to coach fencing or were you just focused purely on like getting better and improving yourself? Hmm. In that time, I was doing a bit of both. Well, I, towards the end, actually, I was um, doing a little bit of coaching. Um, and But that was mainly used to like fund my fencing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when I was 18, I was, I, was, I was like training as much as possible, sort of doing eight sessions a week um really trying to push and, and, and go for it and i was also doing a bit of coaching on the side mm -hmm. so um, the coaching sort of like helped me um right. help me help me help me fund my progress but i was also whenever i was i was younger i was always trying to help out the the younger ones as well because mm -hmm. we there's always there's always younger ones at the club and i'm always keen to give them advice mm, very cool awesome man well thanks for jumping on here and I'm excited for you. And I, I would love to try to bring you on a couple of years from now and see how much different things are then than they are now. So I, I think this is going to inspire a lot of people who are watching to, to pick up the freaking phone and, and, mm. <laughs> and start making some dials. Uh, Absolutely. so that's, that's very good insight from you. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much oh. for having me on.